Hi, this is your host, Dennis Williams with Money Talk Viewpoint. I want to thank you for joining us again. I am with Cash Map Consulting in which I coach people through the process of making small changes in the way they manage their cash to build wealth using bank products. Love to be able to share that with you. And we have again with us, Mr. Charles Dents with Excellent Profit Strategies, where his focus is helping companies move from a space of, of a plateau in which they've tried multiple approaches of kind of kicking things up into the next gear and they've not been successful and, and walking them through the steps of making that a reality. And so Charles, welcome again. And again, those three opening steps that you share with us, let's touch on those again as it relates to kind of what the three steps are from going from plateau to growth to achieving what the owners want to be able to do with their business. Yeah, so thank you, Dennis, for opportunity to be on the podcast once again. And yeah, we, we focus on identifying where companies have reached the plateau, they kind of hit the ceiling. Uh, and we so we assess that. And then once we assess it, then we look at how they then can move forward. So we put a plan in place and we execute on that plan. Then ultimately, we look at how we can help them sustain that execution. Fantastic. And some of the ones that you touched on previously was, of course, um, the ability to use AI as a part of the guidance process. Another one was scalability yeah. of, of creating um, efficient um, process flows to enable that to happen. And then what was the third one? Um, I, I, I believe it was also, um, again, the idea of, of taking new processes and, and again, ensuring scalability was, was, was that, yeah, was that, that what it was? yes, it's definitely scalability and that's the sustainability part, uh, because in order to grow, there has to be some, uh, effort in terms of efficiency and that efficiency leads to scalability uh, and the consistency leads to scalability. Okay, so in order to create an environment of sustainability, what, 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 what's required? What, what has to happen? Well, I think first of all, everyone has to be on the same page, right? So you're, when you're dealing with, uh, each company has their, their own personality. And so what we have to do is help understand what that personality is, understand how that organization is led, uh, and then uh, make sure that there is a consistency in terms of implementation, again, as it relates to the culture, because every culture is different. So we have to understand what that is uh, in order to uh, affect change. So you, you touched on it, but you didn't quite nail it yet. And that was the whole thing of culture. And culture, I, I've been a part of organizations in which there have been two very different dynamics. I've I've seen I've seen companies in which employees are taught just to do what I say. Hmm. And the executives are not looking for feedback. And they don't really want bad news. Then I've seen others in which it's the team, the individuals who are, are bringing up to people's attention changes and, and discrepancies in performance in which they're kind of pushing each other to do better. So in your experience, it does, does you know, what's the ideal? And before you start implementing anything, how do you make sure that the right culture is in place? Because if it's not, it sounds like you're inferring that they won't be successful. Uh, well, yeah, it's more than, than, a, than an inference. It's, they won't be successful. And so the, the key thing is that initially we do an assessment, right? So we're assessing 
not only, you know, from an operational standpoint, there are efficiencies and inefficiencies, there are strategic, strategic planning, you know, where, where they are with that, but we're assessing uh, their leadership. We're also assessing the, uh, the people who are involved in, in making change. So in doing so, uh, we're asking probably some hard questions would be considered hard questions. We, we want to know what's working, what's not working, and why. And we do, it, we do it anonymously so that it's understood where the bottlenecks are. And then we help address those bottlenecks in a very diplomatic way uh, because we, we want to approach it in a strategic faction, fashion, right? Uh, to affect change. So essentially, it's a change management type of approach to make sure that we are addressing the root causes of what's causing bottlenecks, keeping a company from uh, basically scaling to the next level. Because more than likely, uh, yeah, systems, processes, procedures, can certainly be a culprit. Unfortunately, what we find is leadership and their interaction with staff is at the core of what prevents a lot of progress. So that's the reason why we do the assessment and it becomes more of a change management type of approach in order to ensure that uh, the right approach is taken in order for them to make progress and break, break through any barriers. So you're really relying on, on all the participants to put everything on the table to identify where problems are and what problem to attack first. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's correct. And so what happens with that is now we are basically putting in place uh, uh, the attitude of transparency. And in some, depending on the organizational culture, transparency may not be part of that culture. To your point earlier, you know, it's a do what I say, you know, type, type of environment and not an environment that is collaborative. So now we're introducing a level of transparency that may not have been there before. And so that takes work. It takes uh, a willingness to drop, drop, drop your guard, so to speak. Uh, and so we like to break that barrier because without breaking that particular barrier, progress is very limited. So, you know, if I'm an executive listening to you, in which I just kind of like the idea of, of, of telling Dennis, I just need you to go do this. I, I didn't I, I didn't ask you your opinion. How do you move management staff to the idea that getting feedback while it takes more time, the outcome will exceed their expectations? Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting point uh, because, yeah, and so you're uncovering, you help me uncover a lot of layers here. So th there is a layer of what then would be considered a layer of, of executive coaching, right? Because now that leadership, those executives, it's not something they don't know, but it has to be something that they accept that more can be done when more heads are involved. And from an innovative standpoint, Innovation requires the input of others. And without that input, then your, your ideas may be great as an executive, but they could be so much better with input. Even if, you, even if the end result is still your idea, if you get input, you're likely to make it better. And so we have to spend time with the leadership, with the executives to help them understand that it, it is in their best interest to 
probably change some of their approaches if they are uh, a do as I say type of leader to help them understand that there's a there's a better way and getting input from others is is okay and it doesn't diminish their authority in fact it pro it enhances their authority i would i would guess that the experience has been by when you do an operational audit of identifying bottlenecks and you bring that to the executive attention that for the first time they begin to learn um, what they didn't know. You know, there's, there's that adage, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Yep. You think you're in control, but you're not. Is that a fair one? Very fair. And that, that happens in everything we do right? We just, we always don't know what we don't know. And in, in the case of uh, a leader that's actually receiving that feedback, if they don't have mechanisms in place, like a 360 degree type of feedback situation, or they don't have, you know, organizational assessments that, that happen on a regular basis to, to track, you know, the the attitudes, if you will, and behaviors of the organization, if that's not normal, then it's also a shock when it's, when it's done by someone externally, right? And, and bringing, bringing that input to them, the results back to the leadership team, it becomes shocking. And they have to be willing to accept the fact that change is needed based on input that's given the consistency of the input that's given but even before that happens the leadership team they need to be prepared for that type of feedback if it's not if it's not normal they need to be prepared and they need to understand they will experience some exposure because the feedback may not be kind toward them as individuals it may not be kind toward the leadership team as a whole. So they have to be willing to, again, let their guard down and be transparent and open to, to change. And that's what change management's all about. Okay, so, so let's kind of move forward a little bit and then talk about, you've gone through this operational audit, you've now identified you identified the bottlenecks. You've prioritized perhaps the bottlenecks that are going to cause kind of kind of like the low hanging fruit. So you're starting with those. Um, so 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 now you've got that. So now the key question is, how much do you bite off at one time so that you can so that so that the organization is actually sustainable? Yeah. So, you know, people aren't overwhelmed by while creating chaos. Yeah. So then it's a, it presents an opportunity to work with the leadership team to prioritize because you can't bite off everything at one time. It'll never work. So you prioritize. And I think it, then it becomes a, an opportunity to to demonstrate how delegation works effectively. You're prioritized, you make assignments, and those assignments are essentially delegation of, of authority to correct what needs to be corrected, uh, to put in, whether that's uh, uh, in new processes, procedures, whether that's augmenting processes, procedures, whether that's you know, updating, whether that's just making the organization aware uh, it, of the most efficient ways to get things done and the most profitable way to get things done. So it, it depends on the organization, but it, more than likely, it results in the opportunity to delegate authority. And, but first the, the leadership team has to be willing 
to do so. And they also have to be aware that it's going to be painful. Painful. I think it's in most cases it's painful. So what does that mean? It means that we have been cruising along doing things one way, whether good or bad. And now you're basically interrupting our, our daily routines and our, and those daily routines are already very busy. Now you're interrupting our daily routines in order to implement change. And that's what I mean by painful, because now there's, there's this appearance of extra work that has to be done. And as possible in their experiences, they've gone down this road before and it didn't work. So now, you know, there is a bias that's in place that you have to work through. So in order to ensure that, that there's understanding that there, there will be effort, there will be quote unquote pain, if you will. And, and pain simply means that there is, there is additional work that we have to do this on top of our daily activities. Cause you still have to sustain what, where you are in order to, in order to grow. So that's what I mean by pain. There has to be acceptance of, I got additional work and this additional work will be beneficial, but with anything that has to do with growth, there is there is a certain level of, of pain that comes along with that, and that's that, that's in life. You know, growth. There's there's something that's uh, uh, uncomfortable. If you don't want to call it pain, there's something that's uncomfortable about growing. So I can think of a couple of items, and then I and then I have a, a question and for you is is uh, as a former CFO at a small hospital with uh, billing issues. To your point, we saw as a part of process the need to train some staff, and then as they learn the information, having to in and then with a new system incorporate what the workflow changes were going to be in order to put them on track. Or similarly, when at working at a software company, same the same issue is identifying the workflow and then how people are gonna do things differently. And one of the things that I discovered was habits die hard. <laughs> people, people kind of easily slip back to what they, I mean, you can have a meeting and say, everybody agreed to do X, and then you come back and find that only half the people are doing the new X and they're still doing the Y. So that means you got to be having regular check-ins. So how do you, you know, what, what do you recommend for regular check-ins to create sustainable change in those, in those early first few days of a new system? Yeah, uh, I, I, like, I like the term check-in. Uh, it, and it's more than a few days. I mean, it's, it has to happen over a regular, has to happen regularly over a sustained period of time. Uh, uh, because to your point, people do things by rote. And so they are very habitual. Old habits are very habitual. And so there has to be checkpoints in place. So um, one of the things, there's a couple of things uh, that we like to do is we like to have the, the leadership team that they are the ones that are actually doing the instructing and teaching. Because as you know, when you have to teach something, you really learn it and understand it, right? And so we like to start there and then we like to have, you know, whoever their lieutenants are do the same thing. But in the process, we also have them put in place. And initially uh, that this, these checkpoints happen more often so depending on the, the organization, uh, it may happen every every initially every week, and then we move that ultimately to every month and then to every quarter. So it it's the checkpoints begin to not have to happen as regularly, but initially they need to happen fairly often because people will fall back onto old habits 
And not only that, they just may be confused, you know, because the, now they're trying to make a change to something that they know very well. And now they're having to change and do something new. Uh, so we also like to, uh, if you will, I think, you know, from the standpoint of making it exciting, we also like to uh, kind of gamify, you know, this, this, the whole process so that it's, so that it's fun. Uh, because the reality is change is not always fun. And when you talk about change, some people embrace change. They thrive on change where others are quite the opposite and change essentially shuts them down. So you have to make sure that you have the right uh, processes in place so that uh, when you're doing the checkpoints that you're identifying those who are basically locked up, if you will, and having a hard time making progress versus those who are running so fast, full speed ahead that maybe they're also missing some things that they need to be doing because they're just embracing this whole idea of change. So, so it may be, I know it may be that what you find yourself doing is having daily check-ins to identify where things might have gone awry so that you're not leaving it to chance. Is, is that, is that right? Yeah. In some cases that is the case. Uh, and that is the situation um, again, depending on the organization and the people who are involved. Uh, but initially that that certainly can be the case. Cause you, you, you may have, you may have overlooked something in the process change that now comes up just to make sure that you've not left anything to chance. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I say early stages of implementation uh, because during that implementation, you know, there, there is a uh, kind of a, a lack of a better term, kind of a, a beta testing of it, if you will. And mm -hmm. so you, you basically are uh, in, in the trenches, which creates a, a daily check, so to speak. Uh, but once that is, once you've gone through kind of that beta phase, and that's what I mean by moving to like the weekly, the weekly check-in, that doesn't mean that, you know, from a, you know, if you're using an agile type approach that you don't have a daily standup just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, and, but that, that weekly checkpoint is to basically to check, to make sure that everything is on point, everything is flowing. Uh, and that there are no gaps, but initially, yeah, for sure. Uh, the, the daily, and, and we'd like to use the daily stand-up because it's, it's usually quick and there's a, uh, a, a process of, of checking with everyone and you can get through that. And that's, you know, you're not going into a, a meeting room or whatever. Uh, you're, you're trying to get through that, that daily checkpoint pretty quick so that everyone can get, get on with their daily responsibilities. Okay. Now those are those are great points. Um, wow, our time has gone by so quickly. Uh, Charles, please uh, share with our audience just for follow up. Um, just how do they get a hold of you? And and um, and also, I, I think I want to take this opportunity to remind our listeners that um, we will be doing this live so we can actually take your questions uh, next month in which we're looking at uh, doing this um, on uh, June 11th at uh, uh, 11 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, one o'clock uh, Central Standard Time uh, in order to uh, that, that the listeners can participate in our conversation. But uh, yeah, Charles, yeah, let Let's hear a little bit more of how people get a hold of you. Well, the, the easiest way to get a hold of me is, is to go to our website here, uh, excellent.com. So www.excellent.com. That's the quickest way. And you can schedule an appointment with me on that website. Also, you can connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, look for Charles Dents, D-E-N-T-S. Make sure there's an S on it uh, so that you'll find me. But Charles Dents. And we could either connect there or again, you can schedule time with me 
on my website. All right. And then the uh, is are there any any limitations as far as the size of organizations that you work with? Yeah, we'll we'll consult with any organization. We don't have a, a limitation. You know, if you say that there's a sweet spot, we are looking at uh, organizations that are 25 employees or more, but that varies as well because it, it may be a smaller number of employees, but they may have a number of vendors and uh, consultants or and so forth that they are temporary workers that they're working with. So, you know, we're looking for companies that have a staff. And so that that's really... Uh, our sweet spot. And so we like to generally say 25 employees or more. Okay. Very good. Fantastic. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to continuing the dialogue with you uh, next month and being live and, and uh, kind of getting some spontaneous questions from the audience, just to kind of uh, you getting questions from somebody else other than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been, you've been great. And I, I look forward to, the live audience and having that interaction uh, that should be fun should be fun yes and yeah. um, and and again for our listeners again i want to thank you again for joining us here at money talk viewpoint uh, again i'm dennis williams with cash map consulting where my focus is really a couple of specialties one is just making some phenomenally simple changes in the way that you manage cash that has multiple applications on being able to avoid interest costs and in turn accelerate building wealth uh, as well as uh, assisting organizations in, in culture change and transition with uh, improved employee performance. So until next time, uh, we wish you the best and uh, you can get a hold of me at uh, Dennis at cashmapconsulting.com. My website is www.cashmapapp.com. And uh, Charles and I would uh, love hearing from you. Thanks again for listening. Thank you. <laughs>